Welcome to another update in orthopedics. I'm Andreas Loeffler, and you might know me from previous meetings. Unfortunately, we are entirely virtual this year, and we hope to change that in the future. I want to talk to you today about spinal fusions. As you know, there is a little bit of controversy whether or not we should fuse. And I want to give you some background and some overview why, in fact, I continue to fuse some patients. Chronic back pain in Australia affects about 16%, which in 2015 was 4 million people. You see many of these. It affects all ages, but the highest rate are those over 45 related to work, sport, injuries and accidents, and sometimes diseases. And there's, of course, an increase in the elderly. There's lack of fitness, increase of weight. You know all this. And uh, recurrent episodes, which may be severe at times. And together, we treat many of these patients. Back pain has a negative effect on the quality of life and a limited ability to work and socialize for many patients. It is said to be the third most common health conditions and a cause of psychological distress. More common, it is also associated with other disabilities. Chronic back pain may also be associated with leg pain. It may be related to posture and activity of the patient. It may be referred from abdominal organs and we must remember the erupted aneurysm, the kidney stones, and sometimes, of course, there's tumor and infection. So beware of the red flags, which are constitutional symptoms, such as weight loss, night pain, fevers, and sweats. Now, what do we do when we have patients with chronic back pain? We investigate them, and the best still is the MRI. The MRI is expensive. The government is limiting some of its use, and so many patients have a CT scan. We can add the bone scan with SPECT to localize pathology. X-rays are occasionally in the dynamic views with flexion and extension, which shows up instability. And of course, we also do blood tests. The MRI is very sensitive, shows the neural structures well. But of course, many patients want us to show where the pain is, and it doesn't do that for us. Remember also 20% of normal people have dark discs. So a dark disc alone is not proof of pathology. And so the MRI needs to be used with caution. Here you can see so-called modic changes, that is high signal in the vertebral bodies adjacent to an abnormal disc. And that in somebody who otherwise has a normal MRI, I believe is an indication of local pathology. In this case, in fact, it was infection. The MRI compared to the CT scan shows the epidural canal and the compression of the nerve roots much better than the CT scan. And here I've contrasted the two. This patient does not need a fusion, but he does need a decompression. So with all these patients with chronic back pain, we know that many respond to physical therapy. Some require lifestyle changes, and we give such advice. Occasionally, we need medications or injections, but they are really for short-term solutions. We need to exclude sinister causes, such as infection and tumors. And so rarely we end up with surgery, such as a spinal fusion. What is a fusion? Actually, it's an unphysiological treatment because we actually stiffen a motion segment. We get two bones to grow together with or without implants. Now we do this in the cervical, in the thoracic and in the lumbar spine. The principles are very similar. There's a little differ, difference in the anatomy. And also there's a difference in the risk, whether we operate next to the spinal cord or to the nerve roots. But most common is the lumbar fusion, and I will confine my talk to the lumbar 
area today. The incidence has been calculated variably. And in the United States, there's been a great increase in lumber fusions. These are figures from uh, a while ago, a 30% increase, and again, greatest in the elderly. Australian figures are very similar. There's a very large increase in that period stated above. And interestingly, most of that increase happens in the private system. So we do sometimes suspect that there are some other factors involved. Now, when we have deformity, such as with scoliosis and kyphosis, there's less argument. When we have instability, we have some argument whether or not to fuse and how to fuse. And when we have neural compromise, we normally decompress, but sometimes we need to fuse as well. So you can see that there is argument amongst surgeons at least whether or not one should fuse. Relative contraindications to fusions are comorbidities. The patient is not fit enough to have an operation let alone a large operation. Sometimes osteoporosis becomes prohibitive because the bone is weak. We need to be mindful of the psychological state of the patient. And smoking is a relative contraindication as it interferes with healing of the soft tissues and fusion of the bone. So the controversy again is what to do with simple degenerative disc disease or with simple mechanical back pain a degenerative spondylolisthesis, or if we have had a previous surgery, what to do with the adjacent disc, which has now collapsed. This patient, for instance, had a simple discectomy 12 years ago. Now you can see that the rest of the spine looks good. He's a young man, but he has mechanical back pain from that collapsed disc. So we have options here. We can send him back and do more exercise, which he's exhausted. We can tell him he has to live with it, which he might not wish to do so. We can do an interbody fusion from behind. We can do a fusion from the front. So these are the questions which go around patients or our surgical community. Here is a patient with a spondylolisthesis. You can imagine this is gradually developed. It's an isthmic spondylolisthesis, so there are PARS defects. There's chronic pain, mechanical symptoms, some nerve root symptoms, but the patient is otherwise well. We can either leave him, we can fuse in situ, or we can try to restore the alignment by performing a fusion with interbody cages and restitution of the normal anatomy. Whilst the x-rays might look very good, the outcomes of fusions are of course quite variable. There are many fusion techniques. We can do a simple posterior lateral or intertransverse graft and hope that the graft itself will stabilize the segment. We use inter, uh, we use segmental fusion with pedicle screws. We have anterior column support, either operating through the abdomen, which is the anterior lumbar interbody fusion, or from posterior, we have two methods, cliffs and T-lifts, which vary slightly, but the outcomes are very similar. There is also uh, an x lift, which is the extreme lateral. That is a procedure done by a few surgeons in Australia, but we have had some catastrophes, so it has to be done with great caution. We have the advantage now of computer navigation and intraoperative CT scans. Robotics have not yet made their way into spinal surgery. We have had a device which helped, but it was not fully robotic, and we will have to watch this space. Here, for instance, is a picture of an intraoperative CT scan. The patient uh, can be put into the CT scan whilst anesthetized, and in the background you see the navigation system, which is an infrared-guided 
a device which helps us place pedicle screws with the use of the computer. There are some historical techniques. A posterior fusion is almost never done these days. The interlaminar fusions are also in disrepute because they probably cause additional kyphosis at the adjacent segments and facet joint fusions, which were popular 30 or 40 years ago, are not done currently. Here is a picture of an intertransverse fusion and you can see simple bone graft placed between the transverse processes on both sides and one hopes that the bone graft consolidates and stabilizes those two motion segments. Now, when we have fractures, uh, not all fractures need uh, fusions, but if we have compression of the spinal cord or the nerve roots, or the fear of instability whilst mobilizing the patient, uh, there is also some risk of deformity in some of these uh, fractures. We have a uh, sometimes need to mobilize patients or even those who are paraplegic to sit them up in a chair. These are relative reasons to perform surgery. Here, for instance, you can see a CT scan of a patient who fell off a roof. This is a highly unstable fracture. Fortunately, he had no neurological loss. We fused him with two levels above and two levels below and now he's up and walking. When we have tumors, we sometimes need to excise and fuse. Once we take large segments of the vertebral body, there will be a, a deficit. And so one needs to have additional fusion techniques. Fusion for tumors can be diagnostic or curative. It sometimes requires, is required to decompress the spinal cord or the nerves and provide stability. You can see quite clearly here that there is a collapsed vertebra with a local kyphosis. Now the vertebra above and below were also involved. And so this was a three level corpectomy requiring a large cage anteriorly, as well as stabilization from behind from above and below. And for that, we have special fusion cages, modular, which are then filled with bone graft. This is quite clearly a great advantage for patients with such pathology. Now, surgery in general for one or two levels will take somewhere between two and four hours. Patients require general anesthetics. We have image intensifiers to help us place pedicle screws, and sometimes we use navigation. And then, of course, we need to achieve the actual biological fusion requiring bone graft or bone graft substitutes. Spinal implants, and there are many on the market, the most common are the pedicle screws, mostly made of titanium and some of carbon fiber. They are not cheap, and you can see by the time you put four, six, eight pedicle screws, plus the required rods and cross connectors, we're talking about many thousands of dollars. The anterior column support requires cages made sometimes of titanium and sometimes of peak, which is polyether ethyl ketone with or without screws, we have custom-made implants, and all this adds further to the expense. The bone graft, the best will be autologous graft, which is taken either from the lamina whilst doing the decompression or from the ilia crest, which is where orthopedic surgeons take spare parts. There is, however, a limit to this. And so sometimes we need allograft, which is prepared by the bone bank, either as chips called crunch and sometimes as demineralized bone matrix. And we also have some synthetic bone substitutes, each of which has pros and cons, and we are gaining experience with all of them. Now you remember disc replacements came along as a great solution to uh, preserve 
motion and to avoid the downsides of fusions. Unfortunately, they've had their own problems and currently are no longer seen as the golden solution, which we once thought they were. Sometimes we have multi-level fusions, which are more extensive and of course, more expensive. There's more stiffness, so there'll be more likely to be adjacent segment degeneration. And the complication rate goes up with the size of the operation. Scoliosis is one of the most fantastic examples of a successful fusion. Progressive scoliosis in young people is nowadays treated with long posterior fusions and remarkable results can be achieved. What's not so easy is to deal with degenerative scoliosis in elderly patients where there's progressive pain, progressive deformity. With age come comorbidities and osteoporosis, and it becomes more risky. And we have to balance the pros and cons of surgery. Now, you as physiotherapists are, of course, an integral part of treating patients long before they come to us surgeons and also after we surgeons have done our work. We need to mobilize these patients early. We need to be cautious with activity in the first part when we expect bone to consolidate. We stick to non-impact exercises, walking, swimming, and cycling, range of motion exercises, and gradually we increase activities. Hydrotherapy has been a great advantage in that regard, but as you know, it is not so easy to access we need to not only look after core strength, but also strengthen the legs to get patients up and about. We um, have surgery, but big surgery comes with its own complications. Surgery requires general anesthetic and especially elderly patients struggle with long anesthetics. There may be injury to nerves and rarely blood vessels. Dural tears with more extensive procedures are not uncommon. And we have to be aware of wrong level surgery, which was a major issue in the past. Now, of course, with our modern image intensifiers and with caution, this is hopefully no longer an issue. Pressure, however, with positioning continues to be a challenge as patients lie prone for prolonged periods. And in some, we get ileus and urinary in retention. Now we have some post-operative complications which involve bleeding and DVTs, infection. There may be pain from the surgery, pain related to the hardware or residual pain because the original issue has not been addressed. Further down the road, we may have hardware failure because bones refuse to fuse. And so you can see that the complications are many. Now, some patients continue to have pain and some in fact get increasing pain as there is epidural fibrosis. There may be failure to fuse, which causes a painful pseudoarthrosis. And even if we have a successful operation, there may be adjacent segment degeneration. There are some very special complications, but not rare in our community, as we have patients who have hip replacements as well as spinal fusions. If one fuses to the pelvis, then there may well be altered dynamics. And in some patients, this leads to dislocation. If we look at the outcomes of fusions in general, the results are not so good. The Cochrane Library looks at all studies presented and tries to synthesize the scientific information. The more we look, the less we see because there's a lack of high level evidence. Many studies are inconclusive. We have poor evidence for surgical treatments, but we also have poor scientific evidence for non-surgical treatments. In general, 
fusions at best have a 60 to 70% of improvement. We have to actually define success is a 50% reduction in pain success. For some patients it will be, for others it is not. Up to 20% of uh, patients have some complications and there's a high cost of surgery, both for the individuals and for our community. And yet we have some spectacular results. The best approach I believe is a multidisciplinary approach involving the referring physicians, the GPs who know their patients well, the physiotherapists who have already been treating some of these people. We need to look at work or lifestyle modifications, either with or without surgery. And we need to educate our patients so that they know what to expect. We also need the help of our pain specialists, either for those who have had recent surgery or for those who continue to have long-term problems. The question is when to refer patients for surgery. Well, if you suspect red flags, the best thing is early referral. Those are constitutional symptoms indicating sinister pathology. If we have a deteriorating patient, we refer them. If there's an uncertain diagnosis or failure to improve, it is prudent to refer. And sometimes we just need to refer demanding patients because it will aid their overall recovery if we can get a second opinion to reassure them. Surgery should remain the last resort. We should manage patient expectations, explain the process and the complications, consider the second opinion, optimize comorbidities, and if complex, and I do so regularly, in fact, ask a colleague to help with the surgery. I believe that with careful selection, with good preparation of the patient, with careful surgery and good rehabilitation, Spinal fusion can still help many patients, controversial as it may be. I hope that this lecture has given you some reason to think, and I'm happy to answer questions which arise in the usual fashion through the Author Sports website. Thank you very much.